Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture, Architecture in Film. I'd like to begin by thanking Ms. Crystal Lindstrom, the Cole Faculty Advisor, for keeping the summer meetings going when I was unable to. Uh, I'd also like to thank Mr. Myers, our coordinator, and Mr. Munoz, and the rest of the faculty for supporting the students' efforts. I would like to thank Sarah and Vivi, Walter, Anissa, Ugo, and Alex, those uh, who worked hard over the summer to make the lectures happen. They continue to work hard to make sure all the events go on with very few hitches. Finally, thank you to the Architecture Society for indulging me in starting off this year's lecture series by presenting to you a brief discussion of uh, kind of a prelude uh, to tonight's feature. One of the many intrigues in architecture is that when it's done well, one can experience being transformed into space, another dimension. A couple of my most memorable experiences have been in the courtyard of the Salk Institute at La Jolla, California where the two Luises, Louis Kahn and Luis Barragan, offered framed views with well-proportioned structures, a courtyard, the sky, and a simple fountain leading to the ocean, and the metropolitan cloisters in the Upper West Side of New York, whose important architecture takes you back to medieval times. As probably everybody knows here, uh, one of my other favorite things is movies, uh, which is probably why my son got into film rather than architecture. TV and film have fascinated me because through that media, it transports you just like architecture to a fantastical event. Who can forget traveling in hyperspace to get away from the empire or being in a race car with the gamer turned race car driver, the Gran Torino, Turismo. The setting of the story is identified through the architecture, which has been intertwined with film since its inception. Both media address a cultural expression concerned with space and time and the people who occupy them. The architecture gives the spatial narrative and sets the story of the movie, be it past, present, or future. The type of architecture, depending on the state or condition it finds itself in, identifies the, the character's human condition. Are they poor, wealthy, middle class, common man, or powerful? Run down but taken care of structures are indications of humble conditions. I just recently saw a million miles away, and despite being poor immigrant farm workers, their house was very well taken care of. Dilapidated, demolished structures can identify an absence of human presence or of a space occupied by vagrants or gangs and violence. A high quality, high end materials are to identify the very wealthy. In this image, we find ourselves Barbie looking over, I suppose what is Barbie city, where a number of plastic looking architecture exists. But some of the architecture, if you take a close look, is really identifiable. At the upper left, we see a sign which was typical of a 1950s, uh, 60s structure uh, known as Dingbeck Architecture. Dingbeck Architecture is given that name because of its stylistic symbolism placed on the structure. Just to the right of that is LAX's theme building, which was one of the first structures to be built at LA's airport. Designed by Paul Revere Williams and Associates, Mr. Williams is the first African-American AIA member. Now in front of us is a series of mid-century modern or beach houses, 
also very well known in California, with an open plan and implied large panes of glass. Here we have Mr. Paul Revere Williams with the theme building in the background at LAX's airport. Here is one of the many bowling alleys done in the 1950s and 60s with that dingbat architecture and the dingbat symbolism or symbols in the sign. And then to the lower right hand corner there we have a photo by renowned architecture photographer Julius Schulman of Richard Neutra's case study house number 22. One of my favorite movies to watch because of the architecture is the Ten Commandments. You see here the poster. Uh, it's, it's in German. I didn't like the American posters, but I really like the German poster because of its wonderful colors the costumes have. Uh, there is uh, Joel Brenner as Ramses III and Charleston Heston as Moses. Uh, and and uh, Queen Nefertari is played by Anne Baxter. Here the Jewish slaves are building what can be insinuated to be the mortuary temple at Luxor. The slaves are working in a harsh conditions, moving heavy stones while the architects and engineers are directing the construction. The Pharaoh, Ramses III, lives in a beautiful uh, palace here he is in a, a wonderful quarters with his queen, Nefertari. The space has a nice balcony that overlooks the kingdom. You see the uh, Sphinx and some of the other structures in the background. Meanwhile, the slaves work in an unfinished stone or mud brick buildings with light, uh, with little light in comparison. The lower right hand corner we see the reconstruction of Luxor's temple, the, the main entrance, showing the obelisks at both sides of the entrance and a series of King Ramses. And then in the upper left hand corner we see the avenue of sphinxes that leads up to uh, what remains of the temple. You're going to find out I have a variety of favorites uh, in, in movies. They are all from different genres, different types of movies. This one here is Kill Bill. So this is the first image and how the massacre at Two Pines Church is set with this stucco finished pueblo style structure or church and is also what the world thinks el paso looks like in fact it is in lancaster california in the mojave desert outside of los angeles its true name is the calvary baptist or the sanctuary adventist church this next image i really like this image of the rice paper wall indicative of traditional Japanese construction. This, along with the blue light and silhouetted characters, is a backdrop for an epic fight between the Crazy 88s and Kido. Later, we have a scene with Oreshi, Oren Ishi, or Cottonmouth, and the Black Mamba in the beautiful Japanese garden hashing it out to the end. Lastly, I couldn't help but point out Bud's trailer home. Also, an, a magnificent image of our beautiful city. Not just this image of the crappy trailer home, but Bud works at a rundown, low-life uh, strip club. Quentin Tarantino, although I do like his movies, really does not paint a great picture of us. 
Coco is a wonderful story depicting the Day of the Dead. There are altars and structures everywhere built to honor our ancestors. In the animation, we are introduced to Miguelito, who wants to be a singer in a humble courtyard with his grandmother, who opposes his desire. The architecture is of simple stuccoed finishes with terracotta roofs and a small space for storage identified by the corrugated metal roof. In the story, Miguelito finds himself in the world of the dead and must find his way back to the world of the living. We see the beautiful scene of the city of the dead as it parallels the towns in Mexico. He is singing with Hector Rivera, who later finds out is his true grandfather. You can see the many textures in the scene, the cobblestone streets, stucco finished structures, a series of arches in the background held up by Tuscan columns and balusters above identifying the balconies and at the street level, uh, private property also by defined by the balustrades. All around is plenty of color and sets up a joyous scene. Here is Ernesto de la Cruz's mansion, high up, unapproachable, with a series of elaborate stairs leading up to his empire. We can identify exuberant finishes, exaltation, and wealth. This next image is a good segue leading up to our featured movie. This example, we see a vertical world where the Aztec or Mayan pyramids are at the lower levels. And as time progresses, the architecture changes with the time period. This is what we will see in tonight's film, with the exception that we are identifying time rather than social class. Let us talk about vertical cities, an idea that has been a theory and proposal since urbanism and architects have tried to solve the issue of overcrowding. In episode three, Revenge of the Sith, we find ourselves in Coruscant, a vertical city where the Senate with the Emperor and the Jedi are at the uppermost levels with buildings uh, for each at opposite sides, indicative to traditional plazas where the government building was on one side and the church was on the opposite to make sure corruption did not occur. This is a view of the higher levels of Coruscant. At this level, we see clear skies, clean air, and to the right, a very elaborate walkway with a suggested red carpet floor leading to the grand entrance of the theater where the wealthy convene and socialize. Seen from a different view, we see Coruscant with highly trafficked uh, highways, the skies are polluted, and it's really not pleasant. We also see the uh, multi-levels of traffic. The skies are plagued with reckless drivers abruptly crossing the organized traffic lanes as we see Anakin driving through there. Blade Runner in 1982 featured Harrison Ford as a replicant hunter. Later we find that he questions that perhaps he too may be a replicant. The setting is a vertical San Francisco after a disastrous global war where the atmosphere was radioactively polluted, forcing people to seek shelter in protected spaces. This is similar to Coruscant, or I should say Coruscant is similar to the vertical San Francisco. We see multi-levels, uh, multi-level lanes to get the various levels of verticality. Also like Coruscant, the lower levels of San Francisco lack natural light. It is very dark except for the neon lights. The streets are dirty with lots of pollution and reserved for the dark and shady characters who dwell at this level. High above is where the wealthy live, 
above the radioactive atmosphere with picturesque views, though the architecture depicts a cold, hard, and uninviting environment. I will take us back a couple of decades because as mentioned, the concept of vertical cities was thought up by urbanists and architects attempting to solve the problem of overcrowding at the street level. Rem Kuhlhaas describes this tendency in his book, Delirious New York, and shows proposals and discusses the ambition that the architects had. The first movie that I know of dealing with a vertical city and expressing its side effects through social class identification is 1927's Metropolis. The proposals were always depicted as beautiful cities with fresh air and joyous scenes. In the movie, we find that to keep this image, the poor are kept at the lower levels and they are the ones working to keep the power running for the wealthy to enjoy. The workers are exposed to harsh, unbearable, unsafe, and inhumane conditions and is shown by the smoke and industrial architecture. Above, we see the wealthy living worry-free with wonderful gardens above decadent conditions. Here, the architecture of, is of Byzantium era, thought to be a highly intelligent and fruitful, fruitful civilization. Bringing us to our featured movie, High Rise. An adapted novel, High Rise, by J.G. Bollard. This movie brings us to a high rise that is designed by an architect. The architect behind this structure is charged with creating a utopian society in London and devising a system where the poor are at the bottom of the towers, and as you climb up the tower, so does your economic and social status. All areas are intended to be equitable based on your financial reaches. Let's take a look at the architecture. Here we see a series of concrete towers in what is considered to be brutalist architecture. These uh, styles of structures were built in the 1950s out of concrete and were thought to be cold and uninviting. Obviously, a lot of symbolism behind this. Um, Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation is a good example of this uh, type of architecture. And, but, you know, personally, I love the architecture of Louis Kahn, who was also considered a brutalist. Uh, his concrete structures are just magnificent. The Salk Institute in La Jolla is, is just breathtaking. As, as so is the Kimball at the Fort Worth, uh, in, in Fort Worth. Building A is also a, uh, a, a copy of Louis Kahn's Salk Institute. Nonetheless, that's just the way people have seen brutalist architecture to be. And uh, you can see how cold this uh, concrete looks in, this, in these images. So cold that uh, dark events happened in this place. As you can see in these uh, images, uh, in the background, uh, someone commits suicide because he can no longer stand living in the towers. Worse yet, that nobody really realizes what the tragedy is, and it takes the police a very long time to come and clean up the mess. I will conclude the discussion here, but we leave you with one final thought about the dangers of having this kind of structure. We are currently facing a dreadful reality under construction in Saudi Arabia called the line. With that, thank you very much.